make a few quick announcements. Um, if you're new or newish here at Mountside, there's a green pouch somewhere near you and a green card. We'd love to get your information. You can put your name, you can put your email. We would love to say hi. If you are not getting our text messages, we would love to text message you, and that way we can keep you updated on everything that's happening here at Mountainside. There's also a prayer card in there. If you need prayer, uh, you can fill that out and put it in the offering box in the back. And um, we always keep an, a giving envelope in there as well. So let me say this. Let me bring up John and Jen and Quinn. This is John and Jen's last Sunday here at Mountainside. So up there, come on up. <laughs> I'll try to make some room here. So uh, John and Jen have bought a piece of land in Washington and are going to cut down their own trees with axes and build their own cabin on that piece of land. So it'll be about the manliest adventure ever. <clears throat> so um, they will be leaving, and we're going to miss them greatly. John and Jen have been a part of Mountainside for 2011? near the beginning, yeah. uh, uh, as probably as close to the beginning as anybody who's left here. <laughs> and so they have been fantastic. They've been servants of the church in all kinds of ways. Uh, they have reached out to people in the church and loved people behind the scenes in all kinds of ways. Uh, they will be deeply missed, and they are a wonderful family who um, I, they're a big blessing to their next church. And so we love you. We appreciate you. Um, and I really want to thank you from the bottom of my heart as a friend and as your pastor and you guys being here all these years. I really do appreciate it. So let me, let me just pray for them. <clears throat> Father God, I thank you for this great family, uh, for John, Jen, and Quinn. And we pray that you would um, bless them pray that you would use them. I pray that you would pave a way for them uh, in Washington and you would work out all the details and make things go smoothly and quickly. And uh, Father, allow them to be such a blessing at a new place, just like they've been a blessing here. Father, thank you for their love for one another, but most importantly, their love for our Savior, Jesus Christ. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Love you guys. <laughs> John, did you ever win the men's golf tournament or the golf tournament? You won once. That was your you cheated. Okay. So at least we get, we're getting rid of cheaters for the golf tournament. Um, who else was a cheater? Dave is next. <clears throat> so a couple other quick announcements. We've got the men's breakfast this Thursday. Tamarack Junction's been great. 7 a.m. Men of the church come at 7 um, they're putting, allowing us to sit together, and they have kind of an area that's great. It worked out really cool the last time. And then we've got a women's art night coming Saturday, October 9th at 7 p.m. at Nika's house. She's super gifted at this. If you want to do this art together, show up at Nika's, bring a beverage, appetizer, dessert to share. It costs us $15. It would be a great night. And then now our big announcement. So this morning was the last... Um, 10 a.m. service. So there will be no more uh, for a, a time here. There's no more park service. The, the park is gone. Uh, the park, we went from cold to hot back to cold again. And that's our time at the park. Um, so that will no longer be. The next, and we're going to give you an order of events after next week. I'm only asking for you to put in your head one thing. And that is Next Sunday, you need to be here at 6 p.m. I would make it mandatory. <clears throat> but I told Allison, I put Allison on a plane. She's at a bean counters convention <laughs> where you learn how to count beans better. And so she's gone right now. But she, my, I, I rolled over in bed. I said, I'm going to make this thing mandatory. And she said, really? That implies you have some kind of power to discipline people who don't show up. And I'm like, yeah, you're right, honey, I don't have that. But I'm just going to say it's mandatory and um, put idle threats out there. So I'm honestly asking you, we've been around 13 years. I've never done this. We've never had an all-congregational meeting where we ask you to come. Um, but God has moved on our behalf. And the information that the elders will give you uh, next Sunday night 
is stunning. It's stunning. And it will pave a whole new way for Mountainside moving forward. I am asking you, I am pleading you, I'm begging with you, please, whatever you do, cancel anything else that you have next Sunday at 6 p.m., if at all possible, and be here for that night. And um, it's just incredible. It's just honestly incredible. Somebody was praying. I don't know which one of you was praying, but one of you was praying. And I guarantee it was a woman. Because the men get together, our prayer goes up to the ceiling, comes right back down. So one of you women were praying, and God said, I hear that voice. So really big news. Please, I'm begging you, be here 6 p.m. right here next Sunday. So we have been going through uh, a four-part series. If you would, turn with me to Matthew chapter 18 is where we'll be this morning, this morning, this evening. I get my mornings and evenings mixed up now. Uh, in the morning, it's freezing cold wind blowing, and I don't have to scream. Here I'm mic'd, and we have electricity. So uh, having electricity has been nice. Um, well, let me recap real quick. Last week, we had our baptism service. Fantastic. Praise God. Eight people got baptized last Sunday night, and what a great joy to go out these doors, walk three doors down, and jump into a pool. I can't tell you what a blessing that was in years past. I mean, we've dunked in uh, rivers, lakes, streams, uh, freezing cold water. I remember one year, and uh, we baptized Reagan uh, last week, which was awesome. I baptized her mom and her dad. And I think it was that year we tried to find a place in the Truckee, and the Truckee gets low, fast, and it was towards the end of the year. And I dunked this lady, and I slammed her head into a rock. And the Chucky was so low, it was like at her shoulder. And so I'm, I'm like scooping water over her head, just trying to make this thing work. And, and we're like, we called a timeout on that. Because number one, not enough people come to support it. And number two, it, it's just hard. And so the elders of the church really make it a, make it a priority, and this is our, our stance now. Baptism is always done at a service. Always done at a service, so the maximum amount of people can be a part of that baptism. It, it really is that important. And so I'm done going to Rivers, Lakes, and Streams, and uh, again, want to thank uh, Pastor Mike Stewart, the pastor of this church, who got us the, the ability to get over there and to, to dunk people and and then we had seven, and then Michael comes out of the woodwork at the end, almost makes me cry, and uh, it was just, it was fantastic. So thank you for showing support towards one another. Eight people baptized after COVID, truly unbelievable that God is continuing to do a work with us, and we very much give him all of the glory. So I was praying about a sermon series on how shall we then live. It's a four-part sermon series. We've preached on two of them. We're going to go through a third this evening, but it was my way of thinking with all the pandemic and all the problems and all the stuff going on, I feel pulled in a ton of different directions, and I really wanted to focus on four ways, four key points of the Christian life that we need to be living and really focused on. Point number one was that we need to be living a life of love. If you forget about love during this time, I'll tell you what I don't see a lot of. I don't see a lot of love in our world right now. I really don't. We need to be people of love. We need to be focused on love. And I challenged the congregation to be salt and light. And part of that challenge was be salt and light by doing a good deed. We need to be doing good deeds around us. We need to look. I, I told you during the pandemic, I found myself focused just down on my own life. When, I mean, early on, you go to a store, you can't buy toilet paper. It makes you focus on yourself a little bit too much. We need to have our heads up and focused on others. So as soon as I said that, and as soon as I challenge the congregation, what happens? I'm at my cubicle, and I get a headache. So I go to the 7-Eleven to get a Diet Coke, which I never go to that 7-Eleven, because everybody knows I love Maverick, but there's not a Maverick nearby. So I had to go to 7-Eleven and get a Big Gulp. I'm filling up my big gulp, and I hear behind me a lady frantically coming into the 7-Eleven, and she says, do you have Benadryl? And I told myself, just fill up your Diet Coke. 
That's why you were called to this 7-Eleven, is just to get a Diet Coke. And I, I'm like, if I wouldn't have told you guys to do a good deed and to put your heads up, I, I'm not, I think I would have been selfish. So I put my cup down, I turn to the lady, and I say, ma'am, are you having a medical emergency? Which is unlike me. And she says, I am. I ate a peanut. My whole, my throat swelling shut. Well, if you know me, I'm allergic to nuts. So I carry liquid Benadryl in my truck. And she said, I have Benadryl here, but it's a pill form. That's all they sell. And I say, yeah, and that's not going to work anytime soon. She goes, right. I said, I have liquid Benadryl. If I go in my truck and get it, she goes, I, I literally need it right now. I run out, get the Benadryl. She hammers that. And she goes, you just saved me. She's crying. She's an older lady. She didn't know what to do. And... I just thought in that moment, huh. I have a feeling there's a whole bunch of good deeds around us waiting for us to walk into moments. I actually don't think we have to manufacture this stuff. I, I really don't. To prove my point, the horses are now back in South Reno. Anybody get the horses? I got a, tri I don't know what you call, what do you call 800 horses, a tribe? Like I don't even know, but they're all in my cul-de-sac. And they just, just manure everywhere, everywhere. And it was either, it was one of my kids, we were driving up and they're like, huh, all the manure is gone. I'm like, yeah. Huh, how did that happen? I'm like, our neighbor is an older gentleman. I saw him the other day with a shovel and a garbage can and, he went and did the whole, my whole cul-de-sac. He just did it all. And they were like, that's cool. And I said, you know, you got the first half of a good deed right, but not the second half. See a need, but you got to meet a need too. So they're beginning to see needs, which is awesome, but you've got to meet a need. And so I tell you this out of my own stupidity and sin and selfishness, and looking down into my own life, I think these opportunities are all around us. I think we need to begin to be salt and light to the world. Because according to the Bible, it's our good deeds that will point people to the Father who is good to us. So number one, we're supposed to live a life of love. Number two, we need to live a life of prayer. The very idea of prayer, uh, someone put this the other day, I was reading a book and, and he said, the very idea of prayer means that someone's bigger than you. That's true. Non-believers don't pray. If they do pray, they might pray to the universe, but I'm not sure. It's more of like a karma exchange. When Christians pray, we say, God, you're bigger, better, more powerful, more all-knowing. I'm coming to you for help. I'm coming to you because I admit that I need you. And so when we, when we pray, I want us to be pr a praying people, always praying, going to the Father. And ultimately, when we go to the Father, we're saying, God, not my will, but yours be done. This is my need right now, but I'm also in submission to you because you know more than me. And I need your help, but I also know that you've got something going on, and I want to be a part of that. I'll, I'll tell you this. So many times in my life, I just ask God, will you show me where you're working? Will you show me what you're doing? I want to jump on that train. I want to do that. I want to be, just show me. Show me what you're doing, and I want to jump on board. Anybody else have that prayer? Please, where are you working for? There's been times during COVID especially, I'm like, he's not working anymore. And by that I mean, I contacted 20 people because I'm trying to minister because I sort of get paid to do that. So I'm like, I'll just minister to people. So I'm calling, texting, emailing, meeting, blah, 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 meet, 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 meet. And everybody's like, pound sand. I got to the point, I'm like, God, I'm calling a timeout on myself. I'm literally trying to help people, and everybody's telling me, eh. So sitting in my office one day, I just said, God, would you just show me where you're working? Would you just point me towards a person's who heart, you're working on their heart already, and I'll happily go over there and help. 
but I'm kind of tired of knocking on doors, and it's closed. It's all closed. God, show me where you're working, and let me jump on board with that. Our third point, and something that I think is critical for Christians, especially today, and I have a feeling that there's going to be, need to be some prayer here tonight, is my point number three is we need to live a life of forgiveness. We turn, turn with me to uh, Matthew chapter 18, and we're going to be in verse 21. Then Peter came up and said to Jesus, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times? It's nice of Peter to, uh, to say what he said. Peter's great because Peter always says what you're thinking. Like throughout the Gospels, Peter says, I'm like, yeah, that's what I would have said to Jesus too. Totally dumb, stupid thing to say and trying to impress him or whatever. So in, in this day, the rabbis would have taught that you need to forgive someone three times. Three times. Fourth time, they're host. Write them off. Three times. Common teaching, common practice during this time. So here's what I think is cool about Peter. He says seven. I think actually Peter's learning from Jesus, and I think he's like, hey, the common teaching of my day, I know what the rabbis teach, and I know what this new Jesus teaches, and it's not the same. There's something different about Jesus. I think Peter's like, hey, Jesus, do we forgive people seven times? Which is taking the common three, doubling it to six, and just adding one because you're a good guy. I mean, seven, that's a lot. I think that Peter is learning. I think Peter's like, I don't think retaliation is what Jesus is all about. I actually think he's about forgiveness. And I'm going to learn, and I'm going to, I'm like trying to put all the pieces together. At the same time, where Peter fails is, he's still counting. Don't forget this point. As long as you are counting, you cannot be a fully devoted follower of Jesus Christ. What do I mean by counting? Huh. I wonder how many times she did the dishes in the last week. I know I did them like five. I'm not sure he did the dishes as many times as I did. How many more times do I have to help this person before they kind of wake up and grow up and figure out life? How many times do I need to say the same thing? How many times have I kind of forgiven him and he hasn't forgiven me? How many times have we watched one of her movies and not one of mine? How many times have I gone line dancing with her and she won't go paintballing with me? How many dresses does she need? Do the amount of shoes that she owns correlate with the amount of golf clubs I own? We're all counting. We're all counting all the time, guys. We are. And Peter's like, I want to count. I want to count. He's still counting. And then here's Jesus' answer, verse 22. Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but 77 times. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. And since he could not pay, his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and his children and all that he had in payment to be made. So the servant fell on his knees, imploring him, have patience with me and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave him the debt. In the Greek, the way that Jesus says this, so Peter says as many as seven times, and Jesus says, and these words in the Greek is, far from that, with an explanation point. Far from that. I mean, it's a straight rebuke. Not seven times. 
but 77 times. Now, some of your Bibles will read 70 times 7. That's the way, is it? It must be the, in the KJV that it says it that way because I grew up in Awana, and I think most of the Awana verses you memorize out of the KJV. Is that true? Probably. It's an inferior translation, but it's still okay. Um, the KJV only guys need to hear that. It's an inferior translation. Um, so the Greek says, far from that. We don't know if it's 70 times 7 or 77. The point is a big old number, a big, huge number that you couldn't really count against a person unless you were really taking tabs. Jesus is essentially telling Peter that his followers don't calculate numbers. Forgiveness is unlimited and should be a way of living your actual life. The way of Jesus is away from counting and it's straight to the heart. So to prove his point, Jesus speaks in parables. His parables are always great, and this is an easy one. A man, a servant, a servant or slave, depending on your translation, and we really need to get rid of, when we hear servant or slave, we really need to get rid of thinking like early American slavery. That is not what was going on here. The man, the servant who lost this amount of money, this amount of money is 10,000 talents. A talent was actually a unit of weight, not money. So one talent was between 50 and 80 pounds, and you're talking either silver, gold, or another precious metal. What you're talking about here is like millions. Well, there's no turnip farmer in, in that age who loses a king millions of dollars. There's no common servant who loses a king millions of dollars. This is a higher up in the king's strategy line, whatever, and he's doing business with other countries. He's doing something big. It's the only way you lose millions of dollars from a king. Unfortunately, this man did business with the wrong person. If you're going to lose money, lose money with a neighbor, and in the middle of the night you can pack up and leave and go somewhere else. If you're going to lose a bunch of money, don't lose it to a king who can track you down, knows where you live, and can get his money back. So this king says, you owe me several million dollars. We are not told if this was by accident or stupidity. But this servant, who must have been a higher up, loses a lot of money. But notice what happens. He throws himself at the mercy of the king. The king feels pity for the man. And he just says, you're forgiven. He's totally free and clear. An unpayable debt is gone and erased forever. His account says paid in full. The relief that must have come over that man would have been staggering. God has done that for you if you're a Christian tonight. But not with money, because money matters nothing. With your sin. We do not talk about sin enough in the American church. We don't. The Bible is very clear that we are sinners. That God's wrath is on our head. That the, tails, the scales are tipped against us and there's nothing we can do to change that. Except the blood of Jesus Christ that can cover our sins, separate them as far as the east is from the west, and sink them in the deepest ocean never to be brought up against us ever again. And it's all because of Jesus. We have been forgiven a debt that we often don't think about. We often don't consider. Verse 28. But when that same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him, he began to choke him saying, pay what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, have patience with me and I will pay you. He refused and went and put him in prison until he should pay the debt. Ugh. Denarii was about 16 cents. It was one day's labor. 
So a man who was just forgiven several million dollars is now choking a man out for a hundred denarii, a hundred days labor. The way this story is told, it's, it's, it's a mimic, right? You should see the same elements. A king it wants his money. A man begs. The man shows pity. The man is given forgiveness. He goes out. Another man begs of him. Another man uh, um, um, asks to be relieved. He does not show him pity. He throws him in jail. Trickle-down economics only works when things trickle down. And in the economy of God, forgiveness was supposed to trickle down. So this man does what he's not supposed to do. Have you ever met someone like that? Have you ever been someone like that? I have. I have had moments where I have forgotten how much that I had been forgiven. And I choked someone out for a very, very small amount. And it's embarrassing, honestly. I don't understand us as humans that when we read a passage like this, we, everybody in this room is like, oh, man, that's terrible. That guy, he really failed. Oh, that's just miserable. Oh, I would never do that. And we'll probably all do it this evening. It... it I don't understand why I can solve everybody else's problems, but I can't solve my own problems. I don't understand why I see everybody else's problems, but I can't see my own problems. I read about this and go, what, that, that's stupid. Why would anybody do that? And then I go and do it. It's the human condition. It's pride. It's arrogance. It's sin. It's self-centeredness. It's, it's just evil. And when we read something like this, every one of us is thinking, that was really bad. And then hopefully we're thinking of the last time we did that to somebody. 31. When his fellow servants saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their master all that had taken place. Then his master summoned him and said to him, you wicked servant. I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. And should not you have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all of his debt. So also my heavenly father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. Verses like that make me not want to be a Christian. That's, that's the real deal, people. I mean, we can talk about being, you know, Christians and lots of love and Jesus died for us and that, yep, that's awesome and lots of happiness and lots of cool times. This is the real deal. This hurts. The man failed the test. He was supposed to learn how much he had been forgiven and he was supposed to extend that forgiveness to others. So I want to talk about that briefly because I'm guessing every one of you in this room has someone you need to forgive. I'm just guessing. It might be someone really close to you and they've just been a knucklehead and things have been piling up. Um, uh, COVID was great because it threw everybody in the same house and then you got no away time. So you all just slammed into each other for a year and a half. And then the kids were there trying to learn online and that didn't really work and blah, blah, blah. And it was very easy. It's very easy during this time to get sideways with people. Sideways with people you love. Sideways with people you care about. So forgiveness. That's what I want to talk about for, for a moment. There's a surefire way to never forgive anybody and to be a really terrible person that nobody wants to ever be around again. So I'm going to tell you how to do that because I've done that at times. And that is forget that you are a sinner who's been forgiven of a multi-million dollar debt. Generally, think really good about yourself. Generally, God's sort of lucky to have you on his team. And generally, you're better than the other people around you. 
and generally you're a kind of a judgmental person. That's one way to do that. Unfortunately, it's not what the Bible says. Paul at one point writes that he's like the chief of all sinners. All right, let, let me just make this clear. Paul didn't sin more than I've sinned already. I, I promise you that. He was Paul. Uh, let alone the access to sin that we have in today's world versus Paul's world. Let alone the fact that he goes into cities, gets knocked in the head with rocks, and then goes back into the city the next day to preach the good news of Jesus Christ. Paul's making a point that, that his perception and his humility comes out of that. That He just says, I, I'm the chief of all sinners. God forgave me of so much. I want to extend that to other people. The point is, is that everybody in this room can write the words, no, I'm the chief of all sinners. I, I, I really am. But I know each of you have met people, other Christians even, who you know they've been forgiven of this, this weight of wrath, eternal damnation, pulled into heaven for all of eternity, and they turn to a fellow Christian over minor, I mean little tiny things, and they grab them and they choke them. I have experienced that. I really have. And you think, if you understood the weight of sin that you brought to Jesus, I'm not sure you could behave that way with another Christian or with your spouse or a friend or your children or a coworker or someone you just, you care about. If you forget about the debt that the king has forgiven you, I, you're not going to be able to forgive other people. You're going to generally think that you're better than them, and they sort of deserve the wrath that they're getting. So the way that the king has treated us, we're supposed to turn into others and treat them in the same way. So how do you forgive somebody? I'll tell you what you don't do. You don't think of all the ways that they've sort of earned it or deserve it. That's not what the Bible says. You, you don't say, you know, they've done, you know, if I'm balancing their scale, they're up, they're up two right now. They've got a couple of good works. They're going to ruin that in an hour. And they're going to flop on them. The point of, the, of this passage and the point of forgiveness in the Bible is you, you don't look at people and go, man, I... Uh, come on, just well it up in your heart and figure out a way to forgive them. And they, they just, they're a good person. No, they're a terrible person. Okay, they are. They're a terrible person, just like you're a terrible person. And they deserve the wrath of God, just like you deserve the wrath of God. But the point of the Bible is, in order to forgive them, I start with me. Some of us have to calm down a little by going into a dark closet, shutting the door, and rehearsing your sin for a little while. And remembering the darkness in your life. Now, in another way, have we been saved by grace through faith? Absolutely. Are those sins separated as far as east from the west? Absolutely. Does God hold your sin over your head? No, he does not. Because of Christ. But if you find that spiritual pride welling up in your soul, go into a closet. I remember, so youth pastors are the best because youth pastors lie to you. Um, and they scare you into repentance. It's awesome, and it sometimes works. When I was a kid, I had a, a children's ministry person uh, bring a rat trap to, to um, Sunday school. And they had a pencil, and a rat trap's the big one, not the little mouse trap. And they put the pencil in the rat, rat trap, and the rat trap completely obliterates the pencil. And they say, if you die without your sin, that's what God does to you. This is third graders, all right? So you're in third grade. <laughs> snap, break, that's eternal damnation. Good luck with that. Hey, kids, how many of you want to accept Jesus as your Savior? Every kid in that whole place lined up. I remember the line going from the door all the way down. There was one kid sitting down. 
One kid. Do you know who that kid was? Me. Because I didn't buy it yet. I'm like, eh, that seems a little bit fake. I'm not sure what's behind that door. Kids aren't coming back with treats, so we'll, we'll pray about this a little bit deeper. In youth ministry, I remember youth pastor saying, listen, um, God, if you're, not, if you're not saved, God, so we're all in heaven, and God puts up a video for everyone to watch of all your sin, and people just watch it. I mean, just the thought of that should make us run screaming out of this place, like, no possible way. Neither of those ideas were totally true, but I will say that our sin is serious. And the whole point of this is never I grab this and beat someone up over their sin. This is not a telescope where I peer down at you. It's a mirror that I look at myself compared to the holiness of God, and I say, I don't match up. And only Christ can fix that. That's the point of the Bible. But if you're so worried about beating everybody else over the head, you're going to miss the point. No, this is about me and God. Because I can't answer for that person. I can only answer for my sin. And when my spiritual pride wells up, I, I'll tell you this, I either go outside, I go to the, um, so my timeout. So basically I call timeouts on myself. If you're new to Mountainside, that's what I do. So instead of calling a timeout on a child, I call a timeout on me. And a timeout on me means I either go to the garage or I go outside where the smoke has been terrible. There was one day I breathed in the smoke for one hour. It was a timeout on me. So I call a timeout, I'll go somewhere and just rehearse. Just talk to God. Calm down, talk to God. And one of the ways that you guys need to start doing that is you need to begin to pray and thank God, what are, what's my sin? Really, what's my sin? What have I done? Where, where can I repent? Where can I remember? If I'm going to hold the dishes or a thing or a minute scent piece against this person, God, I'm going to have to back off for one second and remember what I really have been forgiven of. And that's the point here. You aren't forgiving them because they deserve it. You aren't forgiving them because they've earned it. You're forgiving them because God has forgiven you. At no point has I talked about, have I talked about reconciliation. That's different. I am not saying you need to invite a crazy person into your life and let craziness happen in your life. I'm not saying that. So we're going to pray now. And I want you to think about someone that you know. You know you need to forgive them. It's probably someone really close to you. It's probably someone who has, who has hurt you on purpose, accidentally. I want you to put this person into your head. Someone that you, you know it. You know you need to forgive them. And you're not going to forgive them tonight because they earned it. You're not going to forgive them because they deserve it. They, they don't. You're going to forgive them because the God of the universe took a million dollar debt for you. And he said, that's gone. And out of that abundance, you're going to offer some of that to a fellow servant. So let's pray together. Father God, each person here tonight has somebody that I know they need to, to forgive. Maybe they're remembering something that was hurtful, mean, it was upsetting, it was hard, it was difficult, it was, uh, Father, something that wasn't fair, it wasn't right, it was wrong on many, many levels. And we're going to pray this prayer. Father, thank you for forgiving me of my debt. I was full of sin and selfishness and then Christ forgave me. And now I stand before the Father and the Father sees me just as he sees the Son. My Father in heaven does not hold things against me. 
He is not angry with me. He is not bitter at me. He loves me. And Father, out of that, I want to offer a fellow servant some forgiveness. I admit that it's pennies compared to what you have forgiven me, Father. But I want to offer that to that person. I want to release them from this thing. And Father, ultimately, I really want to hand them to you and say, Father, you deal with them. You love them. You care for them just as much as you care for me. But I don't want to hold this over their head anymore because it's making me miserable, Father. And I'm wrong to hold that against them. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen.